Tonight we've come through the rain and the storm to show our gratitude for the King of Thailand. It's been a hundred days now since he passed away, and we still want to make merit for him. We still think of him, the goodness he's, he's done for the Thai people, and it even spreads here to Wat Meta, and all the people here. If, if it weren't for him, Thailand wouldn't have lasted through all those years of people trying to take it over. And who knows what would have happened to the forest tradition. We wouldn't have had any chance of finding out about it from us, for our, ourselves, to test the Dharma for ourselves and benefit from the Dharma. So we have a debt of gratitude, which we're happy to pay. Because this kind of debt is paid by the practice. In the same way as the Buddha said, if you want to show homage to him, you practice. In the same way you show gratitude to people who passed away, you practice and dedicate the practice to them. And the difficulty of coming here through the rain is nothing compared to the example set by the king. Going through the, the jungles of Thailand up into the mountains, in the very poor places where the roads are non-existent, trekking in to make sure that progress could come to everybody in the country, even the people way off in the fringes. To remind you that goodness comes with difficulty, but that doesn't make it any less good. It requires strength inside, strength of character. And so when we take lessons from people of the past who have done good for the world, that's one of the main lessons we have to take. If we want something good in life, we have to create goodness, and goodness requires that we put in effort. Which is not just a matter of using strength. You also have to use our discernment. Discernment lies at the basis for all right effort. It begins with seeing that our skillful actions lead to what's good, unskillful actions lead to what's bad, so we've got to do what's skillful and abandon what's not. And we have to learn how to recognize which is which. That's the first role for discernment. Because sometimes unskillful things come start out very small, a little bit of lust or a little bit of anger or a little bit of greed or whatever. And at first it seems very innocent. But if we're not careful, it can grow and grow and grow. And then it pushes us out, as in the John Cha's image. You live in a house that has only one seat. As long as you're sitting in the seat, you're in control. But sometimes you let other things come and push you out of the seat. Greed takes over. Anger takes over. And they do this by slipping in surreptitiously. until the seat is theirs. So you have to watch out for these things. You have to learn how to recognize unskillful states as they first whisper in the ear. And you have to learn how to recognize skillful states when they first are very small, too, like a little bit of concentration. At first it doesn't seem like much. It's the same ordinary concentration that you use, say, to read a book or whatever, listen to a conversation. You pay attention for a bit, and then you lose it. Well, you pay attention again, and you pay attention again, and try to stitch things together with your mindfulness. So those little bits of concentration add up. So learn how to recognize the little sprouts in the ground that are going to be good, that are going to be trees that will give you shade, give you fruit. And learn how to distinguish them from the weeds. That's the first task that discernment has. The second task is making yourself want to do this. It's not that you go through the motions or you force yourself. You've got to make yourself see that this really is a good thing. This is why you have to give yourself pep talks. This is why so many of the Dharma talks from the Ajahns and Tyler are pep talks, basically, encouraging you. 
even when the ajahn is yelling at his students in a step number talk, criticizing them heavily. It's encouragement. It's just that the ajahn is concerned and that the students are worthy of concern. So take that attitude to yourself. There are times when you have to speak gently to yourself, other times you have to be a little bit more harsh to make sure that the mind doesn't get complacent. Whatever is required, you try to use your heedfulness, you try to use your compassion for yourself and other people, your sense of pride that you're a meditator, you're a monk, behave like a monk should sense of shame when you realize that you're behaving as a monk shouldn't be, behaving or thinking about things that shouldn't be. These are all ways of motivating yourself to really want to do the practice, and that's an important part of the role of discernment in right effort. The next part is to figure out what effort is needed right now. Does the effort have to be mainly on getting rid of unskillful qualities or giving rise to skillful ones. Or if skillful ones are already there, what can you do to maintain them? And what can you do to make sure the unskillful ones don't come back? That last one tends to get neglected. When you're meditating and you realize there's going to be a difficult situation coming up in the course of the day, it's legitimate to take some time out of your meditation to think about how you're going to deal with it. Wait till the end of the, the hour, the end of the period, and use your concentrated mind, the mind that's been still, the mind that's been refreshed by the practice. And work out how you're going to avoid giving rise to unskillful qualities in that difficult situation. Then there's a final issue about how much effort is necessary right now. As the Buddha said, but some, some defilements, all you have to do is just look at them, and they wither away. The reason they've been able to grow in the mind is you haven't been paying attention to them, or you haven't recognized them for what they are. Once you recognize them and look at them, you realize that this is really stupid. And that doesn't require much effort. All you have to do is just look at them, and they're gone. There are others, however, that when you stare at them, they stare right back. And even worse, they insinuate themselves as they make you think that you're, that's what your attitude is. You identify with them, they become you, and then it gets really hard to get rid of them. This is where you have to do everything you can, all the tools at your disposal, the way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself, the images you use to explain things to yourself, all the different forms of fabrication. Asking questions, trying new perceptions, anything to get that unskillful state out of the mind. Or if you can't get rid of it totally, at least give it a good karate chop so you can have some more time to get the mind into concentration again. So right effort isn't brute force. The point of just right isn't always Middling, you know that image of the the image of the loot. That has to, that has, to, that has to do with basically how much you're capable of. If you're only capable of so much, okay, that's the amount of effort you put in. But there are times when the task requires more, and you've got to figure out how do you get more energy, more discernment to deal with it. You don't just muddle through the middle. You can figure out how you go to the root, root of things. So that requires storing up more energy through the meditation, through your concentration. Because this is a serious battle. These defilements, when they take hold, they can make you do all kinds of things that you're later going to regret. That's a Worst thing to take with you as you go is regret that you hadn't put more time into the practice. 
that what you thought was you or your attitude has left you, and it's left you high and dry. You don't want that to happen. So you leave those attitudes behind, and you benefit. And it's this way that discernment and, and effort go together. Because discernment without effort is just empty knowledge. Effort without discernment is just a waste of time, twisting the cow's horn to get milk. You need the discernment to know what to, part of the cow to pull and how to pull. And actually do it. It's a combination of knowing how and then actually doing it. The two help each other along. Because you can have a theoretical knowledge, a general idea of how to do things. But it's when you actually try them that you begin to learn more lessons about the ins and outs of getting what, what you want from the cow, getting what you want from the snake. The snake, they said, the, you pin the snake down to get its venom. Some people say, why, why pin the snake down? Why, why hold on to it? Well, you have to hold on because you want the venom for a good purpose. Because that's what knowledge is for. It's for you to put it into use and then get the benefit. So make sure that your efforts and your, your knowledge go together, your discernment and your persistence. Keep them very close to each other, because they can teach each other a lot of lessons. Lessons that give results. And the results we have here, they're like all the aspects of the Buddhist teachings on happiness. It's not just your own happiness. It, in one sense, it is just yours, the happiness that comes when the mind is really trained. But the benefits go around. Other people benefit from the fact that we've been training our minds. If we want to dedicate the merit like we're doing tonight, we've got good merit to dedicate, and the person who receives is going to be happy. that high-quality merit is being sent his way. <laughs>